Good morning, folks. Welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So as I mentioned in a short yesterday, I uh, got my hair cut about time, looking downright haggard, as I usually do, actually. I've got that taken care of in London and also got my medication. And thanks to you guys, everything thoroughly covered at this point. So once again, thanks so much for your support, man. It was all over with in about eight hours um, from the time that I made my appeal. You guys are amazing. Once again, thank you so much. So Artemis, as you can see, I'm pretty much doing daily updates on Artemis right now, as long as there's anything valid or anything relevant to be uh, talked about. And that is indeed the case. Artemis, well, rather, Orion has just entered into its uh, distant retrograde orbit, um, and this is sort of a unique thing. Why the hell are they using this orbit? Because, I mean, they're not going to ever use this orbit again. This is not the orbit that's going to be used for the Lunar Gateway. This is not the orbit that's going to be used during Artemis II. They're never going to use this damn orbit again, aside from maybe some other purpose, but certainly not for Artemis. So why is this going on? And also, you know, we're told that all of these tests are taking place, but not a tremendous amount of specifics as to what's going on test-wise. Now, there is one particular test in regards to fuel slosh that may be very useful for Starship, and I talked about that in my episode yesterday. If you haven't seen that one, feel free to check it out. It's linked at the end of this video. But really, is Artemis 1 going to be able to accomplish everything it's supposed to accomplish with this unusual orbit, with the time it has at its disposal? And really, what's it supposed to be doing anyway? We're going to find all of that out right now. So according to Mike Serafin, Artemis mission manager, quote, without crew aboard the first mission, DRO, or the Distant Retrograde Orbit, allows Orion to spend more time in deep space for a rigorous mission to ensure spacecraft systems like guidance, navigation, communication, power, thermal control, and others are ready to keep astronauts safe on future crewed missions, unquote. So it's a distant uh, orbit, obviously, because it's a long ways away from the moon and from the Earth and retrograde because it's traveling around the Moon opposite the direction that the Moon travels around the Earth. This is, in fact, a very stable orbit, and one that Orion was supposed to be carrying out for a very, very different mission at the beginning of the whole SLS project. As you may recall, those of you who've been following this for a long time, going back to the Moon has not been SLS's primary mission until very recently. Originally, some ideas in regards to deep space missions like going to a near-Earth asteroid, capturing a smaller asteroid, and then bringing it back to this distant retrograde orbit was one of a number of proposed missions for the Orion spacecraft. Orion was not designed to set down on anything, obviously, since we're going to need an HLS to set down on the moon. It was instead designed to go and check out low-gravity bodies in deep space space, like asteroids, for example. And after hauling one of these asteroids back to a DRO, that asteroid would remain in place in that orbit for as long as a century. It's an extremely stable orbit. But why is Artemis making use of it now? Well, because it is such a stable orbit. That means you don't have to be carrying out very many operations in order to keep Orion in that orbit. You can essentially leave it there. So during that time, you can test out the various systems on the spacecraft without having to worry about it drifting off course while you're doing these experiments. And NASA has been doing just that. Please subscribe! So where was I? Oh yeah, the test. So there's a lot of things going on with Orion right now. And again, it's a lot easier to do it while you're flying through this kind of orbit. The first of these is called the Modal Survey. Orion's equipped with 24 Reaction Control System Thrusters, or RCS, and they're going to be putting the spacecraft through a number of small firings of the engines to see how it moves the spacecraft around and whether or not the navigation system that they're using is going to coincide with the 
thrust that they experience. In other words, to make sure that the navigation and the reaction control thrusters are in sync. Until they're able to do that, they can't actually carry out large transational burns for more than 40 seconds. In addition to that, they have optical navigation camera certification, and that's something we've heard a little bit about. As a matter of fact, we've been able to take advantage of it in getting these absolutely fantastic views. And Orion uses two star trackers, sensitive cameras that take pictures of the star field around Orion, the moon, the earth, and compares the pictures to a built-in map of the stars. And it also carries a secondary camera that takes pictures of the moon and earth to help orient the spacecraft by looking at the size and position of the celestial bodies in the image. It's surprisingly similar to navigating by the stars the way mankind's been doing for a couple of millennia. So at several times during the mission, the optical navigational camera will be tested to certify it for use on future flights. It can also be used to help Orion to autonomously return home if we lose communication with the spacecraft. In addition, there's a test called Solar Array Wing Camera Wi-Fi Characterization. The cameras affixed to the tips of the Solar Array wings communicate with Orion's camera controller through an onboard Wi-Fi network. Flight controllers will vary the positioning of the solar arrays to test the Wi-Fi strength while the arrays are in different configurations, and this allows engineers to optimize how quickly imagery taken by the cameras on the ends of the arrays can be transmitted to onboard recorders. Not terribly exciting but still useful. Also, there's the crew module service module surveys, and this is using the cameras on the four solar array wings to take detailed photos of the crew module and service module twice during the mission to identify any micrometeoroid or orbital debris strikes. Again, extremely useful, especially in the aftermath of Columbia, where an unseen debris strike ended up in the destruction of the spacecraft. That won't happen with Orion. On top of that, they also have the Large File Delivery Protocol Uplink, and the engineers in Mission Control will be uplinking large data files to Orion to understand how much time it takes for the spacecraft to receive sizable files. So during the mission, flight controllers use the Deep Space Network and also Goon Hilly to communicate with and send data to the spacecraft, but testing before flight hasn't included using this network, so they'll be testing all of that as well. On top of that, they have something called the Star Tracker Thermal Assessment, and what they'll be doing here is characterizing the alignment between the star trackers that are part of the guidance, navigation, and control system, and the effects of the sun on this system, because obviously sunlight is going to have a significant impact on all of the materials exposed to sunlight, and this of course will impact not only the systems themselves, but also the amount of propellant needed for spacecraft maneuvers during crewed missions. Also, the radiator loop flow control. There are two radiator loops on the spacecraft's European service module and they help expel heat generated by different systems throughout the flight. An extremely useful piece of equipment. There are two modes for the radiators. During speed mode, the radiator pumps operate at a constant speed to help limit vibrations in the primary mode during Artemis 1 and during launch for all Artemis flights. And then there's control mode, which allows for better control of the radiator pumps and and their flow rate, which is used on crewed missions when more refined control of flow through the radiators is desired, and all of that is being tested too. Then you have the solar array wing plume. Depending on the angle of Orion's solar array wings during thruster firings, the plume or exhaust gases from those firings could increase the array's temperature, so they're going to determine how much of an impact that has on the spacecraft. Propellant slosh, which I discussed in the previous episode, and then the search acquire and track mode, which is an algorithm intended to recover and maintain communications with Earth after loss of Orion's navigation state, with extended loss of communications with Earth, or after a temporary power loss that causes Orion to reboot its hardware. So to test the algorithm, flight controllers will command the spacecraft to enter it that mode, the search, acquire, and track mode, and after about 15 minutes, restore normal communications. Testing this mode will give the engineer confidence that it can be relied upon as the final option to fix a loss of communications when humans are on board.
You also have the Integrated Search and Rescue Satellite Aided Tracking, or SARSAT, functionality. Boy, is this getting complicated enough for you? And that will verify connectivity between the beacons that are worn by the crew on future flights and ground stations receiving the signal. The beacons will be remotely activated and powered for about an hour after splashdowns. All of this, of course, has yet to happen. And also, during the splashdown procedure, the entry aerothermal process will be uh, tested and what that is is a series of 19 reaction control system firings while the spacecraft is in the atmosphere to determine how well these thrusters perform in the midst of extremely high heating on the spacecraft. They have pre predicted performance of these thrusters, but they can't be certain until they actually test them. And then finally, there's the ammonia boiler restart, and that will be turned on for several minutes. That is to say the ammonia ammonia boiler <laughs> stroke. Okay. And then restarted to provide additional data about the system's capability. Ammonia boilers are used to help control the thermal aspect of the spacecraft to keep its power and avionics systems cool and to keep the interior of the crew module at a comfortable temperature for future crews. <sighs> Is that enough for you? Well, guess what? There's even more. Remember, Orion is not a moonship, it is a deep spaceship, and therefore it has a life support system for that particular mission. It's equipped with advanced environmental control and life support systems designed for the demands of that kind of mission. So that system had already been tested as far as the atmosphere is concerned on the space station, but what it does is removes carbon dioxide and humidity from inside Orion. Also, it saves volume by using this kind of technology because if you weren't uh, removing the CO2, recycling it, etc., you would have to carry many chemical canisters that would take up the space of about 32 cubic feet inside the spacecraft or about 10% of the crew livable area. There will also be a compact toilet, although it'll be tough to test that on this mission. And then also you will have a variety of other compact systems available to maximize the available space for crew comfort, but also to accommodate the volume needed to carry consumables like enough food and water for a mission lasting weeks. Also, the heat shield is going to be going through a hell of a test, if you'll forgive the pun, because the spacecraft's going to be traveling at about 25,000 miles per hour when it hits the atmosphere, which is significantly faster than Orion was traveling in 2014 when it conducted an orbital test. That being the case, the temperatures are going to be much higher on that heat shield, about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And also, as I kind of suggested before, Orion's going to be going through a 700 degree temperature shift between minus 150 degrees to 550 degrees Fahrenheit. That being the case, you definitely need a thermal protection system, and it will be going through that process as well. And there's one final test, and that's in the field of radiation protection. Obviously, we don't have a great deal of information on how much radiation is going to affect the crew cabin of a spacecraft traveling this far from the Earth. The Apollo missions really didn't have enough information or the technology and sensors to take accurate readings of this sort of thing during that time period 50 years ago, and so as a result, we need a lot of new data, and we also need radiation protection. Not only is the spacecraft equipped with a solar shelter. It also has radiation vests for the crew members on board, or rather for what are called mannequins on board, and these are going to actually be testing the effects of radiation on the internal organs of human beings to the best of our ability without exposing astronauts to these actual events. And herein lies a bit of a problem. Because this mission is not as long as they were hoping because of the time frame that they had to conduct the launch to finally get SLS off the ground, they're not going to have as much of an opportunity to expose this spacecraft to radiation as they would hope. It's less than a month as opposed to a month and a half, which would have been an optimal mission, mission configuration. That being the case, they're not going to get as much data as they might, and this is a bit problematic. And by the way, when I said solar shelter, that's kind of grandiose. The 
actual procedures that astronauts are going to have to go through to protect themselves from a solar particle event are kind of old school and frankly, I don't think very well thought out. And that's something that we need to talk about in a future episode. Just how good is the radiation protection on Orion and are we really going to get the data that we need on this particular mission in order to make sure that astronauts are as safe as possible during interplanetary journeys. So until then, please subscribe. We are less than 50 away from 90,000 right now. And then, of course, on the home stretch to 100K. God, I can hardly wait. Thank you so much for your support and for making this growth happen during my visit here in the UK. And as always, stay angry about space.